All right, good morning. It is 8.35 a.m. on Sunday, March 17th, 2019. I'm Christiana Ellis, and I just got up. This is five more minutes. Happy birthday. Birthday. Happy St. Patrick's Day, I suppose. Is St. Patrick's Day supposed to be St. Patrick's birthday? I don't think so, right? I mean, pre probably not. I suppose the same question could be asked about St. Valentine's Day. Anyway, none of that's why I'm here today, because what I'm actually here to do today is continue my rewatch of Gravity Falls with Season 1, Episode 17, Boys Crazy. And I sang it a little bit because it's the boy band episode, which is, it's a very fun and silly episode of the show. Uh, certainly one of the ones that I think is more memorable as you, you know, as you think back on the whole series, it's one of the more memorable ones, I think. Uh, it's a fun idea, just in general, the idea that you take the criticism often leveled at boy bands that they're they're fake just because they're, you know, assembled by a group of producers rather than like an organically forming group. Um, also, you know, it occurs to me, I don't like, I think probably an accusation leveled is that they don't write their songs. Although I actually am not sure if that's true of like NSYNC and um, uh, pfft, New Kids on the Block. Like, I'm not sure who wrote their songs. I could look that up, I suppose but I'm, I won't, not right now, anyway. So in any event, though, we've got uh, the, the, the A plot here is that for Mabel, her, her favorite, uh, uh, favorite group several times, which is, uh, let's see, I'm looking for the, the, sp the spelling. Uh, so it's S-E-V apostrophe R-A-L, um, and then times with a Z. Uh, so they're coming to town. She's super excited to go see them with Candy and Grenda. And what they find there, you know, this concert sold out. So they sneak in the back and they find out that this fake band is literally not only in not organically forming group, but they're literally all a bunch of clones of each other. Um, and that's, and that's a fun idea, but I think almost more fun than just the idea that they're clones is that they have no experience whatsoever of the outside world. That's really where a lot of the humor comes from. Like, so we, we, you know, our first viewing of them, not in the concert or music video setting is that they're all like in a giant hamster cage with the complete with a hamster wheel and the little tubes to go around and drinking water from the, the little, the little water <laughs> dispenser thing, which is a fantastic setup for later when she tries to teach them to drink uh, water. And that's one of, you know, that sequence is certainly one of the gifts that has made its way into, you know, wider meme culture, that uh, clip of the different, uh, characters each trying their own ridiculous way to drink water from a glass. Uh, that's it, it's it, it's a great it's a great image. <laughs> They're very silly, uh, but so we also have uh, you know a B story running through this where um, Dipper is still jealous of Robbie, um, you know, dating Wendy, and there's. There's a great lesson in there that's complicated a little bit by uh, some ambiguity regarding the idea of subliminal messages in this music. So the for so the the plot as it develops in the episode is that uh, you know Dipper's having great fun hanging out with Wendy. They make each other laugh. It's all very silly, but it's really you know, it's, it's friend stuff because she's still dating Robbie. But then as Robbie comes in, she's mad at Robbie for standing her up and she's going to dump him. She says, maybe we'll see other people. 
and Dipper is, you know, you know, privately, you know, cheering like, yes. But then Robbie says, oh, but I wrote this song for you. And he plays this song and she changes her mind and says, okay, so let's, we'll, we'll try, try again. And Dipper is suspicious of this CD. And uh, he's so convinced that there must be some trick to, to it that Robbie is, is tricking Wendy into going out with him. That he enlists Stan, and uh, you know it's it's a total tangent in this episode. But Stan joins because he remembers a time that a, like a a seventies hippie uh, stole his girlfriend, and I love that sequence just because Stan is flashing back, and it shows him in a very fifties like setting. And he says, I remember going to my favorite 50s themed 70s diner. <laughs> like happy days, right? Anyway, uh, so Stan helps him, tells him about subliminal messages. Um, there's a little bit of weirdness with this idea that he has to transfer it to vinyl first so that they can try slowing it down. And uh, and then and because that's how you hear the messages, but then it's playing it backwards that actually reveals a message, which is you know, you are, you know, your mind is mine, I control you, that sort of thing, which is a, it's a little weird. First of all, that the it's supposed to be like this revelation that doing it backwards is the way to hear it when it seems surprising that that's not always like. Isn't that the way you would expect to hear it? Why would it be a surprise? Why the the idea that you just slow it down to hear it? I don't think so. Hello, Richard Green. Uh, so in any event, though, with Stan's help, Dipper finds out that there is this hypnotic message on the music. They go up and they confront uh, Robbie and Wendy. Uh, they reveal the message. Wendy gets really mad. Uh, Robbie actually kind of says, wait, wait, no, I didn't know that was there. In fact, I didn't even write the song, which, of course, is its own fraud, right? And uh, he was deceiving Wendy in that way, and so she's mad. Um, but it's a little bit confusing, A, where did the message come from? And B, was it actually affecting Wendy? Because as the story plays out, it's, I, it feels like we're meant to feel like the message didn't actually do anything. And that Robbie's real crime there was not writing the song and presenting someone else's song as his own rather than trying to mind control her. But I feel like it all becomes a little bit muddied as far as, you know, like this is a show where the idea of a mind control song is not outside the realm of possibility. But it's not clear in this episode if that's supposed to be what's happening or not. Any event, I think the idea that he didn't write his own song is in keeping with the boy band theme, right? But the real meat, though, the, the actual uh, interesting lesson for Dipper there is that he had been so caught up in his jealousy of Robbie and his, his seeing Robbie as a rival that when he defeats Robbie by revealing, you know, this whole thing, even though the crime, so to speak, was not even what Dipper thought it was, and then he goes to immediately... Uh, ask Wendy out as she's, you know, storming away, and she just totally lets him have it. Of like, I'm I'm horrified and upset and bet feeling betrayed right now because my boyfriend tried to trick me, and now you're taking that moment to ask me out. That's awful. And she tells him that so, and he it uh, it's an interesting lesson to have to have a kid learn in a cartoon like this, this idea of really having it slap him in the face, realizing that he was not thinking of what's best for Wendy. He was being selfish. It, and it's, it's the, the whole thing that underpins this idea of the friend zone, which is to say that if, 
if a guy feels like, oh, I'm stuck in the friend zone, I want it to be more, but I can't because I'm in the friend zone. Well, you know what? You're not being a good friend. So you are still the bad one in that situation. If you are mad at a woman for treating you like a friend. Anyway, um, so they don't actually go there with those specific words. I think when this show was new, I think the, 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 the discourse had not yet evolved on that idea, but certainly the concept is still there, which is to say Dipper is only really pretending to be Wendy's friend because he wants more. And so because he actually wants more and is not interested in just being friends, he, he ends up being a pretty crappy friend. And so that's a, that's an interesting lesson to include. But so in the meantime, that's all happening in the background with uh, Mabel and the, and several times where she, you know, Mabel and Grenda and Candy find these, these guys, they, they realize that, oh, these guys are in a bad situation. They deserve to be free. Got to help them escape. And, you know, brings them back to the mystery shack. And uh, then they realize, oh, the producer's on the run. So they have to keep them hidden. But then, you know, uh, Mabel is so thrilled to have them there and it's so exciting and it's it's fun that it's portrayed as so innocent because she's she's boys crazy about them but at the same time they uh, you know what what does she want to do well they they form it's she's doing like classic sleepover type activities it's like yeah let's get in a braid train where we'll all braid each other's hair that sort of thing and she really takes charge in teaching them how to do things and live life, but she starts getting so attached. Like Candy and Grenda actually, you know, say it even a little bit earlier, which is to say we shouldn't get too attached because the whole plan here is we got to let them go. Like that whole idea uh, at the beginning was uh, they're telling the, the, the band that, hey, well, you know, you got to, uh, you, you, you got to, uh, you know, that your producer doesn't really love you because if he did, he'd set you free. And so that sets up this idea that, you know, Mabel gets pos uh, pos possessive. They, and to the point where when they realize that the producer's out of the picture, which let me come back to that in a second, uh, Mabel tries to keep that a secret from the band that they actually could be safe and go free. But, uh, you know, she wants them to stay with her and that leads her to turn on her friends because they're trying to call her out on that. And that whole thing where ultimately she's guilted into it by the band singing her this song of like, we trust you so much. We know you'd never, never lie to us. And all of the different bands and the way they dance, you know, it's like, oh, no, they're dancing aggressively at us. Uh, all that stuff is just really fun. And, uh, you know, so she learns the lesson. They do have to set them free and they really treat it like these are wild animals that are just being released into the woods, which is kind of amazing. Um, <laughs> and especially it's, you know, lampshaded with, uh, you know, Candy watching them leave and just saying they won't last a week. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's this episode. Um, I, w I wanted to come back to just, one of the jokes that doesn't age super great is the, the idea that because the goat ate his rear license plate, that's why the producer gets uh, arrested and possibly subjected to police brutality and or trumped up charges. I mean, it's left as kind of an implication, but you know, we see them approach the, the, the cops approaching, like, you know, whacking their nightsticks on their other hand, you know, that sort of thing, like, and then the idea is that the producer is going to be out of the picture instead of, say, just receiving a, a, a ticket or something. Uh, that's that's not a joke that has aged super well. Uh, I think that arguably it maybe wasn't as funny as it was meant to be at the time. But anyway, uh, it's all um, it's all just kind of a blink and you'll miss it. And I think it's intended to be innocent, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, so ultimately, though, I think that this is a, uh, a great, very memorable, funny episode, and uh, I enjoyed rewatching it. So I'll go ahead and leave it there, and then I'll talk to you all tomorrow for five more minutes.